I'm so glad you're here because today we're going to learn about the symmetry of molecules. This is an important concept in chemistry and also the field of mathematics and even the world around us. If you look at buildings, artwork, or even the sidewalk on the street, you often see different symmetrical objects that people use to design things. The same is true for different types of shapes or molecules. For example, if you consider a square and you were to consider a point at the center of that square, and you were to rotate around that point 90 degrees, you would see that this molecule looks the exact same. Similarly, if we were to place a point at the center of a hexagon, or in a case of a molecule, cyclohexane, and you were to rotate 60 degrees, the molecule would look the exact same. And in this class, we're going to investigate what that means for different chemical properties. In this video, we're going to introduce the concepts of symmetry elements and symmetry operations, eventually building up to assigning point groups of molecules, which is the complete set of symmetry operations that different molecules possess, and you'll see how we can categorize them by their similarities. And then later in this course, you're going to see how we can use that information to predict things like spectroscopic modes, like how many IR bands we should see during IR spectroscopy, and even how we can use that information to build molecular orbital diagrams for really complicated molecules. And make sure you stick around to the end because I have some practice problems that should help for your next exam. Let's begin by identifying the differences between symmetry elements and symmetry operations. A symmetry element is some geometric object, like a point, a line, or a plane, that lies within a molecule and can be used to perform some sort of symmetry operation. A symmetry operation, on the other hand, is a movement or a manipulation of a molecule that leaves it looking completely unchanged. And understanding these concepts is going to be integral to your understanding of symmetry and point groups. Some examples of those symmetry elements or geometric objects begin with a mirror plane. When you place a mirror plane on an object and you reflect through that mirror plane, and the molecule remains unchanged, we would say that that's a symmetry operation that that molecule possesses. A proper axis is assigning an axis or some line through a molecule where you do a rotation around that axis, leaving the molecule unchanged. An improper axis is actually those two symmetry operations combined. So for example, you would have a rotation along the principal rotation axis, followed by reflection through a mirror plane. So this one includes both of those first two symmetry operations. So that's rotation and then also reflection. Importantly, the reflection for an improper axis has to be perpendicular to that principal rotation axis. And then finally, a center of inversion is assigning a point at the direct center of a molecule and actually doing an inversion through that molecule about every single atom in the molecule. So every atom has to pass through that center of inversion and come out the exact same opposite angle on the other side, and we would say that that is a center of inversion or an inversion operation. Let's walk through all of the different symmetry operations that you can expect to see in this class. The first and the easiest to understand is probably the identity operation, which is often given the symbol capital E. In essence, the identity operation involves doing nothing to the molecule, so picking it up and placing it back down in the exact same orientation gives us the identity operation. So the transformation makes the molecule look exactly identical because nothing has changed. And this is like the default operation that every single molecule or object in the universe actually contains this symmetry operation of the identity. While it might seem trivial, the identity operation is actually a really important operation for group theory. Next up is the rotation operation, which is given the symbol capital C sub N. This actually involves rotating a molecule around a 360 degree circle divided by n number of times. So 360 divided by n is what that n value stands for. For example, if you needed to rotate something by 90 degrees, 360 divided by 4 is 90 degrees, which would make the Cn be C4. If we needed to rotate something by 180 degrees, then n would be equal to 2 because 360 divided by 2 is equal to 180 degrees. So this would be a C2 operation. Similarly, if it were C3, this would be a 120 degree rotation and so on. And we can take a look at one of those examples when we look at a water molecule. So in this example, remember both of these hydrogens are identical. I've just labeled them in a different color so you can follow this transformation. If we were to do a 180 degree rotation through the center of this molecule along this axis, we would call that a C2 operation. Again, remember 180 degrees, 
n corresponds to 2, which makes it a C2 rotation. And importantly, we're going to be rotating along that axis 180 degrees, so a full 180 degree turn. And when we do this, the oxygen stays the same, and the bonds are still in the same position because we've rotated 180 degrees. But importantly, this hydrogen atom, which is labeled in green, is going to rotate to the other side. And similarly, the pink hydrogen is now going to be rotated to the other side. So this would be a 180 degree rotation along this C2 axis. Now identifying what is called the principal rotation axis is going to be integral to your success in assigning point groups in the future. The principal rotation axis is going to be the axis of rotation that has the highest order. In other words, this n value is the greatest number. Occasionally in molecules, you'll see examples where there are multiple rotation axes. So being able to identify the principal rotation axis or the highest order rotation axis is going to be really important. In many cases, the axis runs through the center of mass of the molecule, but identifying it can sometimes be a little tricky. So let's take a look at some examples now. Consider ammonia, for example, where we have a principal rotation axis that will run through the center of the nitrogen atom in this direction. Remember that all of these bond angles are about 120 degrees from one another, and this should give you an indication that this is going to be a C3 rotation axis, because remember 360 degrees divided by 3 is equal to 120 degrees. Therefore, I know that if I were to rotate around this principal rotation axis 120 degrees, this molecule should look the exact same. Xenon Xenon tetrafluoride is a unique example because it showcases our first example of one that has multiple rotation axes but only one principal rotation axis. Consider for example that there is a rotation axis that lies along these fluorine xenon fluorine bonds that we would say would be a C2 rotation axis. So if we were to rotate along this axis we would all of these three atoms would remain in their exact same position, but these two fluorines would exchange, but the molecule would still look the exact same. Therefore, it's perfectly reasonable to suggest that there is a C2 rotation axis for this molecule. However, there is a higher order or a larger number n that we can identify as well. And that one lies perpendicular through this axis. In other words, it is going straight through this xenon atom through the center. So this is the rotation axis. And if we were to do a 90 degree rotation through this, so we would be twisting this molecule in this direction, 90 degrees, where each of these fluorines would exchange, and, but still look identical, we would call that the C4 rotation axis. And again, it's C4 because 360 divided by 4 is 90 degrees. And since this value of 4 is higher than the 2 value that we identified previously, we would say that C4 is the principal rotation axis because this number 4 is a greater value. BF3 is another example where there are multiple rotation axes that we can identify, and being able to identify the principal rotation axis will be really important. So for example, going through these fluorine to boron bond right here, we can identify another C2 rotation axis, where if we were to rotate in this direction, 180 degrees, these two atoms would remain in their same position, but these two fluorines would flip-flop, giving us a rotation axis where the molecule looks the exact same, so this C2 rotation axis is perfectly reasonable. However, again, what you should notice is that perpendicular to this, going directly through the center of this boron atom, there is a 120 degree rotation that can occur, giving us a C3 rotation axis, because this is 120 degrees from one another. And therefore, we would say that that C3 rotation axis is the principal rotation axis, again, because this 3 value is greater than this 2 value. Next up is reflection operations, which is symbolized via the symbol sigma from the Greek alphabet. For reflection operations, there are three different types that we need to consider. The first is sigma v, sigma d, and sigma h. Sigma v is probably the most common, and it's one that contains the principal rotation axis, so that's important. It contains the principal rotation axis, and it also contains one or more atoms. Sigma d, the d symbolizes dihedral plane, and this one also contains the principal rotation axis. Importantly though, that plane actually passes through the angle between two atoms or two bonds. And then finally, sigma h is a mirror plane that's actually perpendicular to the principal rotation axis. We can actually just use a single example of a molecule to identify all three of these different mirror planes or sigma 
symmetry operations. So that xenon tetrafluoride molecule that we looked at previously has all three of these. Remember that the sigma V contains one of the other atoms that are not at the center of the molecule and actually contains that principal rotation axis. In this case, the principal rotation axis was going straight in and out of the screen and we could rotate 90 degrees or a C4 rotation axis. So it needs to contain that principal rotation axis. And the example of that for sigma V is actually the mirror plane that if you were to consider my hand a mirror plane and we reflected around both sides of that, just like a mirror would, since it contains these bonds here and these atoms, these fluorine atoms, we would call that the sigma V. The sigma D, however, again, if you consider my hand to be a mirror plane, would be the one that bisects these two atoms, these two fluorine atoms. We would call that the sigma D because it stands for the dihedral plane. And then remember, since the principal rotation axis is going in and out of the screen, perpendicular to that needs to be a mirror plane in order to be a sigma H. And in this case, since this is a flat molecule, if you consider my marker to be the principal rotation axis, then the entire molecule is sitting on a mirror plane where if you reflect it on either side, the molecule would look the exact same. And we would call that the sigma H. The inversion operation, which is denoted by the symbol lowercase i, involves moving every single one of the atoms in a molecule through the center of the molecule and coming out the other side at the same angle and distance. The center point is known as the center of inversion. So in this case, we would have the center of inversion in between two carbon atoms. So importantly, a center of inversion does not have to exist at the center of an atom, but just at the complete center of the molecule. Now, if we we're to think about what would happen if we were to do this symmetry operation, consider these fluorine atoms, both of which are on the plane of the screen, and if you were to go through the center of the molecule and come out the other side, then both of these fluorine atoms would exchange places. Similarly, for each of these hydrogen atoms, even if we we're to consider the stereochemistry involved, if you were to go through the center and come out the other side, the molecule would look the exact same. And therefore, we would say that this has a center of inversion. Similarly, you can consider benzene as another example of a molecule that has a center of inversion. So notice if we were to go straight through the center of this molecule and come out the other side, then all of these carbon atoms would still be positioned at the exact same location. The same would be true for the hydrogen atom. So if we were to go through the center of the molecule, come out equidistant along the other side, this molecule would look the exact same, and therefore we would say that it has a center of inversion or an inversion operation. Next up is admittedly the one that students typically find the most challenging, and that's called the improper rotation, which is denoted by the symbol capital S sub N, where again that N value comes from the fact that it is a rotation 360 divided by some number N to give you that rotation, just like it was for our principal rotation axis or identifying rotation axis for the N value. The reason that students often times find this so challenging is because it requires you to manipulate molecules twice. If you think back all the way to even general chemistry, one of the most challenging concepts for students was actually identifying the shape of molecules in three dimensions using Vesper theory. Again, in organic chemistry, students often struggle with looking at molecules in three dimensions. Now in this case, in inorganic chemistry, not only do you need to visualize the original molecule in three dimensions, then you need to be able to perform two subsequent symmetry operations a rotation and a reflection and see whether or not the molecule looks identical to identify whether or not there is an improper rotation. Staggered ethane is the most common example of a molecule used to showcase improper rotations. Remember that staggered ethane from organic chemistry means that if you were to look down the Newman projection, meaning between the two carbon-carbon bonds, you would see that the carbon to hydrogen bonds are staggered and are in a more energetically favorable conformation. Staggered ethane has an improper rotation. Specifically, it has an S6 improper rotation, where the 6 indicates that 360 degrees divided by 6 is 60 degrees. So you would get a 60 degree turn followed by a perpendicular reflection through a mirror plane. The symmetry elements contained in an S6 operation are shown here in green, where the principal rotation axis lies between the two carbon-carbon bonds, and perpendicular to that is where you find the mirror plane. These two symmetry elements are necessary in order to be considered an improper rotation. Again, that's rotation through some axis 
followed by perpendicular reflection through a mirror plane. We can visualize what that improper rotation looks like. Remember, it will be a 60 degree rotation followed by reflection through the mirror plane. Looking down, the Newman projection will showcase what that looks like. A 60 degree rotation followed by reflection through that mirror plane gives an identical molecule for staggered ethane. Looking at a different angle, we can see that 60 degree rotation followed by reflection through that perpendicular mirror plane. So again, the first thing being showcased is that 60 degree rotation, and then you see reflection through the mirror plane, and notice that the molecule appears unchanged. I'll show one more example of a 60 degree rotation followed by reflection through a mirror plane. Now let's try a practice problem to gauge your understanding. Pause the video, try this problem independently, and then resume the video to check my answers. For parachlorobenzene, we can identify several symmetry operations. Firstly, we need to remember that every molecule and object in the universe contains the identity operation. Therefore, the first one that we can very easily identify is the identity operation. Next, there are three rotation axes indicated here, where the first one is a C2 rotation that cuts through the center of the molecule perpendicular from this flat molecule. We can visualize that C2 rotation by seeing that if we rotate 180 degrees, that both of the red circles indicate the bromine atoms end up in the same location, as well as does the rest of the molecule. There's another C2 rotation that's perpendicular to that. And that one goes through the two bromine atoms. Rotation of 180 degrees, which corresponds to the C2 rotation axes, indicates that the molecule remains unchanged following that 180 degree rotation. Next, we can see that cutting perpendicular to that one, we have another C2 rotation axis, where if we were to do 180 degree rotation, the molecule appears unchanged. There's also a center of inversion for this molecule. Directly at the center of the molecule, we see that if we were to go inside to that center and come out the other side equidistant and at the same angle, the molecule would appear unchanged entirely. We would call this the center of inversion. There are also three mirror planes. Since this is a flat molecule, this is going to contain a mirror plane that bisects every atom on this molecule, meaning that if we were to do a reflection, this molecule would be the exact same and appear identical. There is also a perpendicular mirror plane which bisects the molecule, and if we do a mirror plane reflection, the molecule would appear identical. So this is what happens upon mirror plane reflection, where the molecule appears unchanged. And finally, there is another mirror plane that contains the two bromine atoms, and if we were to do a reflection through that mirror plane, you would see that this molecule remains completely unchanged. This means that this molecule has eight symmetry operations, which is why we say that its order is eight. The order indicates exactly how many total symmetry operations are possible for a specific molecule. All of those symmetry operations are indicated here, except for the identity symmetry operation, because that one doesn't do anything and the molecule remains unchanged. It turns out that any molecule that contains exactly eight symmetry operations of exactly these types, we would assign that to a class or a group which we call a point group. Specifically, that point group is going to be called D2H. In the next video, you'll learn how we came up with that assignment for the point group. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and comment down below if you have any questions at all related to symmetry. The next video in this playlist contains information about how to use symmetry operations to assign point groups to molecules. And make sure to subscribe so that you never miss another video.